Moving right along. All right. So, we come to the last chapter of the semester. We're down to four plus epsilon weeks. The last chapter five, you knew it well. So, we're going to talk about one of the fundamental ideas in mathematics called compactness. And then we're going to do maximum problems and related linear algebra. So you guys will recall that when you learned single variable calculus, one of the main things you learned to do was to solve maximum minimum problems. Now, Although you weren't given proofs of theorems, you were given statements of theorems that gave you license to go hunting. And then the calculus was supposed to actually give you the wherewithal to actually track the maximum in. I'm actually a peaceful person. This is not meant to be <laughs> war on animals here. Um, so what, what theorem did you guys get to use without necessarily knowing why it was a theorem? It's the maximum value theorem, which said what? That if it's closed, there's a maximum. <laughs> so on a closed interval, if you have a real value function with some hypothesis, continuous. So if you have a continuous function on a closed interval, then it takes on its minimum and maximum values. Now you also had some problems to do where your domain was not a closed interval, so this theorem does not apply. And then you had to go through other means to actually be sure that you would have a max or a min. But it wouldn't be guaranteed. So we want to now deal with these kinds of questions for multivariable functions. So I want to now move on to multivariable questions here. So what was it that was special about a closed interval in the real line? What was special about a closed interval? So first of all, when you say closed interval, you're not allowing yourself to go off to infinity, right? Uh, a limit of it only has one directional Well, we're not worried about derivatives today at all. But so closed, and the second thing is it's a finite interval. It doesn't go off to infinity. So what's a word we have for that now. I'm not sure we've used it yet. Bounded. Bounded set. We use that terminology. I don't think so. I think we use it in the problem. Yeah, we use it. Yeah. So. So let's let's actually make an official definition here. A set S in R n that is bounded. Now we're not, oh I know where we use the word, we were talking about these upper bounds a little bit. A set is bounded if it is contained in some ball centered somewhere. If S is contained in some ball centered at some point of some radius R.
And usually we'll just take the point to be the origin. So usually we'll just take A to be the origin. And you know what a closed set is. You remember that from chapter two. That's when Cal starts getting upset again. <laughs> Recall that S is closed if, what was the definition? The limit of any sequence, any sequence is in S. Any convergent sequence. It's any convergent sequence, so that every member of the sequence is in S, and the limit is in S. Yeah. Good. Yeah. If, for any convergent sequence of points in S converges to a point in S as well. So the limit of a convergent sequence of points in S must itself be in S. Okay. So that's going to give me a fancy definition that we're going to work with for the next few days. A set S in Rn is called compact if it is both of these things. Both closed and bounded. And we'll see when we start talking about maxes and mins in a few days why you actually need some criteria like this. <coughs> now those of you who go, who go on to take fancier math classes in the next few years will see a different definition of this. I'm leading you astray. But this is, for our purposes, this is what we need. So let's do some examples and non-examples. Yeah, the frontier points are included. So you're including the points on the sphere that limits the ball. You vote yes or no? Yes. yes. Well, it's clearly closed, because we said so. Is it contained, is it bounded? Yes. 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 It's like bounded by any ball of large radius. That's it. So it's bounded, it's, in, it's contained in any ball of larger radius centered at that point C. Or if I wanted to be fancy, I could, I could even stick it in a ball centered at the origin. With radius magnitude C plus R. To be, to be obtuse. Greater than C. Because would it be? Greater than C plus R. S is contained in a ball centered at the origin of radius what? Magnitude C plus R. C plus, like something greater than the magnitude of C plus R. C plus R. Where are you getting C plus R? You're going like this. Yeah, and it has to be greater. And you're saying you could take a ball that was just touching it there, and that would have radius magnitude C going to here plus an R there. Now you do C plus R plus one. But you need it bigger than that because yeah, we have so an open ball. So you could take magnitude of C plus two R. 
or you could take plus r plus 1, or you could take anything you want, it's like that. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. I just know one's enough. What? Mm -hmm. How would you know that one's enough? We mean one. You said C plus. You said you said C plus one. No, R plus one. C plus R plus one. Because that's bigger than okay. R. Okay. Plus nine. <coughs> uh, what about? Something like x squared plus y squared equals 6. Yes. In R2. In R, let's say we're in R2. No. Yes. Yes. No. Why no? Because it can, Z can be anything. Okay, we're in R2. Oh, okay. So, so. Mallory's caught me that you have to be very particular about saying where your set is sitting. If you look at this equation, all right, so let, let me finish this. It is, <coughs> it is closed. Why is it closed? No, I want, a, I want a, how do we know the actual sphere is closed? Or circle in this case. Because what did we prove in general? Oh, because no, it's... No, nothing about max and min. Because it's a frontier set of an open ball. Yeah. Okay. Better way. The set of a frontier, the set of frontier points are closed. Okay. Yeah. I mean, because we proved that. What about this equation? Not. Not. Not what? Close. Close. Oh wait, it's not. It's not um, bounded. It's not bounded. Is it closed? Yeah. Yes. Why is this set closed? So, so let's draw some pictures. By the way, just so you remember, this is this is a well-known shape. It's a circle. What's this shape? Hyperbola. Probably not bounded. <laughs> Probably. Probably not bounded. Is that right? Yeah. But is it closed? Yes. Yeah, because yeah, every point in it only has one degree. So Rob, mm, yeah, but how do you know there isn't like a little missing hole in it? Because it's continuous. continuous. It's continuous. What's continuous? Right. Well, no, it's not. Each yeah. half is continuous. Wait, 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 wait. I don't know what it means to say a set is continuous. The function. Can it be defined as a function in terms of. Can it be defined explicitly? So, you guys, how easily you forget these things, especially when I tell you they're important for later on. <laughs> Anytime you take. <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> Anytime you take a function and set it equal to a constant, what are you looking at? Level, level, set. Set. level, level set. set. What kind of function? Oh, that's right. It's the graph. If you take oh. a level set, if you look at the set of x's such that f of x is a constant, this is a level set. Even in Rn, right? If you take f mapping Rn to R, if, if, a level set is closed whenever f is what? Continuous. Yes. Level sets of continuous functions are always closed sets. That's very important. I remember it. And we, what was the proof of that? Um, it's, now that the proof is, they, it's just you made, you made K. You consider they take your level set, call it S, and make a convergence. Take a convergence sequence of points in there. And 
and then f of xk is approaching f of a. Yeah. So by continuity, as Nick just said, f of xk is approach f of a. And therefore f of a is like the, the constant there for a. But what are all the f of xk's? The same constant. They're all the constant. And so how do you have a sequence of C, 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 that converges to this point? If that has to be C. A. That has to be C. Which means that the limit is itself a point of that same level set. Okay, so level sets of continuous functions are closed. And yes, I do expect you to write that when you're using it in your homework or tests. Why is this one compact and this one isn't? Because the second one isn't bounded. Yeah. Okay. So the circle is bounded, therefore compact. <coughs> You're telling me the hyperbola is not bounded and therefore is not. Uh, not compact. So if you have a if you have a definition that requires two criteria. Louder? And one fails. And one fails, it's it's not true. True. then you're out. Mm -hmm. To prove that it's not valid, will we just show that it's a sort of, well, no, actually, how, how do we do that? Yeah, I was about to ask you. <laughs> I was about to say it fits inside a bigger circle, but it doesn't really make sense. There's no finite. Can you say x and y can make a large number you can get Suppose the opposite? Can you just show me that you have points that satisfy this equation that go off to infinity? Yeah. Take the limit. Take the limit. Yeah, take the limit. Well, as limit of what? As, as x approaches infinity, then y. Yeah. Oh, y approaches a. So suppose you picked an arbitrarily large number, say integer n, and you set x equal to n. Would there be a point on that hyperbola? Let's say n large. So you imagine saying there's n. Can you give me a point on the hyperbola? Yes. Yeah. What's the formula for it? The square root of 6 plus n squared n squared minus 6. Square root of n squared minus 6. No, no. square root of square root minus 6. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> Call the C for curve. So I need n large to be able to take the square root of n squared minus 6. So at n bigger than square root of 6, say. But is this, can you see what the magnitude of this vector is doing as n goes to infinity? It's approaching infinity. You take this point and call it. It's approaching n. Call, n squared. Call this point x of n. The magnitude is, I think Mallory said it. Is, uh, well, the y is going to approach n. It's greater than n. For sure. yeah. How do you do the magnitude of this vector here? Square root of 2 times n. You're making it too hard. Just take square root of 2 times n. Ignore 6. 6 is. Oh, because it's square root of 2 times n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's approaching. Right? The length of the vector is at least the magnitude of the x coordinate. The absolute value of the x coordinate. Because, and this certainly isn't zero here, this coordinate. But that goes to infinity. Okay. Not bounded. <coughs> now I'm going to make things a little more complicated for you. Let's look at all two by two matrices. Mm -mm. Even engineers need matrices. All two by two matrices A with determinant of A equal to one. What does it mean for a matrix to be bounded? Well, so that's an excellent question you asked there. So I'm looking at the space of two by two matrices, just a little bit, and 
The space of two by two matrices is looks like what? R what? R four. You know, we've talked about this and it showed up in your homework on web work. Did you right? just so you just think about the matrix A, B, C, D, you think of as a vector A, B, C, D, or maybe you would be happy if I put the B here and the C here. You put the columns in order like that, and you have a vector in R4. So think of the space of two by two matrices as a copy of R4. What does it mean to say the determinant is one, Bryce? What? So S is the set of matrices A where the determinant and where the determinant is A D minus B C and that's one. Taylor? But it's not necessarily bounded because if B and C were both zero and A and D if A was really big, but then D was like 1 over whatever that number is, it would still be 1, but it could go. Yeah, so there are So you're taking arbitrarily large A, yeah. 1 over A, and then zeros here. What's the magnitude of that? So you have matrices of arbitrarily large magnitude, thinking of them as points in R4. So again, it's not bounded. Is it closed? How do we decide if a set is closed or not? Without going back to the definition every single time. <laughs> How did I define the set? As a level set. I gave it to you as a level set of a... Is that function continuous? It's a polynomial. Right? It's a polynomial in the entries of the vector. So it's continuous. So it is closed. being a level set of a continuous function. Kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. AD minus BC mirrors kind of like x squared minus y squared. It's like x w minus y z, but it's a, it's a, this is a polynomial in those four variables. It's a quadratic polynomial. So it's actually a polynomial. take a closed ball minus a point inside it? No, well, it's, it's not going to be... So what's your definition of a Mobius strip? <coughs> what's my definition of a Mobius strip? <laughs> so does everybody know what a Mobius strip is? Yeah. We'll, we'll play with those a lot at the end of the next semester, or the middle of next semester. Basically, you take a strip of paper, and if you attached it, <laughs> You attached it this way, you'd make a cylinder. This paper's not long enough for me to do this. But if you twist, instead of attaching this end to this end, having it line up directly, you turn this once and you attach it so that on the ends they're matching upside down. So you're taking a rectangle of paper and you're gluing the two edges there 
one to the other upside down. If you do that with the other side, doesn't it create like a projective plane or something? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you take a closed rectangle and you do what Matthew asked and you, you attach these things upside down, so I'm not making a very pretty picture of it here, is that a closed and bounded set in R3? Yes. Yeah. 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 Certainly yeah. bounded, right? Yeah. 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 And, it seems and it's closed. Seems closed. Yeah. Yeah. Because basically all you did was you took a closed rectangle and glued it together in some prescribed way. So this will be closed and bounded. Now, it will not be, one of the important topics for next semester will be with surfaces being orientable. Can you paint one side green and the other side red? Yeah. <laughs> well, you end up with a brown muck, don't you? So that, that is a criterion we'll talk about a lot next semester. So the answer is yes, it is. If you make it out of a closed rectangle. Some people might make it out of an open rectangle <laughs> and we have issues. Yeah, because it's not Or a semi-open or something. <laughs> Closed rectangle is. <laughs> what about the null set? Oh boy. Is Dan, I didn't know you were going to be the custodian of the empty set. Are you, good, are you the custodian of the empty set? Oh. It how many, how many times <laughs> that the, the empty set is compact? Mm. No, because it's not going to have... It's definitely close. Well, how do you check how much it is? There we go. It's a close set. It's a close set, but it's balanced. Well, what does it mean to say the set is contained in a ball of some radius? All of its elements. All of its elements. Every point has to belong to that ball. Well, it doesn't. But how do you define yeah, like R zero? Point every point belongs to it, the ball of radius one yeah. centered at zero because there aren't any points. Wait, but that does that's it has makes all, all numbers are bounds for the null set. All radii will work, yeah, right. right? All positive radii will work. Wait, but yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. This may be kind of a silly question, but Matthias and I were talking and noting that that Mobius strip is not a manifold because it has edges, but would it be a manifold if you made it out of open? Edges. I don't know what happens with the cross <laughs> so like an X. Okay, so you're getting into next semester at this point. But if, if, yeah. you took, <laughs> if you took an open interval here, so that you didn't have the actual upper edge or lower edge, mm -hmm. and then you glued it, you would have what would be called an open Mobius strip. It's not including the, the edges, and that would be a two-dimensional manifold. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, it's two dimensional even though the Mobius strip only has like one side. It's, it's two dimensional. Still a two, it's a it takes two object. degrees of freedom to move around on it. Little pieces need to need an open set in R2. Okay. So So I told you the reason we care about compact sets is to be able to generalize the maximum value theorem. So there, let me state it. Theorem. <coughs> Maximum value theorem. And those of you keeping score might want to put a red mark on this. So not only are you responsible for stating this theorem, but either on exam three or on the final, you will be asked to give a proof. So signify in your notes. So the, the theorem says, suppose you have a compact set in Rn, and suppose you have a function from that set to R, which is continuous. So this is the analog of a function on a closed interval that you had in calc, baby calc. 
then theorem says f takes out its max and its min. So to be more precise, there are points, say y and z, in the set S, so that f of y is the minimum value, <laughs> and f of z is the maximum value. So all the values of the function are between the minimum and the maximum. And those so the crucial thing is not just that the function can't go off to infinity, but that the, it actually achieves its minimum and maximum at points of the set. Okay. Why do you think you need compactness to have such a theorem? Well, it's because if it wasn't bound, then it would just go up. If it was an open set, then how so would you... So if you think back to... Back to the single variable calculus, if you were not on a closed interval, if it were, for example, not bounded, <coughs> you'd never have a maximum value. If it's a yeah, thing. you could I mean, have a function that you could have a function that just took f of x equals x would never have a maximum. Or even if the function had a bound, you might have a horizontal asymptote. So you could approach the soup of the values, but never take on the soup of the values. Okay, so these are examples where you aren't bounded. What happens if you're not closed? You could have the max occurring at the edge. Then you have a. So you could you, you could be thinking you're doing a perfectly nice job of having a maximum, but the point where that max occurs just somehow gets left out of the domain. Right. So if you do that, now your function. We're supposed to have a maximum value, but you've deleted the point of the domain where that max would have occurred. So you're, again, you have a soup without having a maximum value. So if you don't have a closed set, you also can also be unbounded. You could have something like the function 1 over x, which goes off to infinity. So even though your set is bounded, even though your domain is bounded, the function still doesn't have a max because the, the domain isn't closed. So clearly these are important criteria that we need to have. application of this, let's look at let's take a Compact set in the real numbers. So here I, I'm imagining some sort of compact set. Here's A. And I'm thinking about this R sitting inside of R2. So I'm thinking of R here as the x axis. Let's let P be the point zero one in the plane. Is 
Is there a point of A that's closest to P? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Is there a point on A closest to P? Function is magnitude of P minus minus P for X of the Yes. Okay. So you have a function that you want to define. Yeah. Yeah. Magnitude. So let f of x. Now x here is going to be a point in A. Yeah. So I won't even. Put, well, all right. I'll think of these as vectors because they're in R two. Okay. And what do I want to do? Or one, because P is one. Oh wait, no. <laughs> so if my point X here really belongs to A, it looks like what? Something over zero. Yeah, something zero. Zero. And the point P is the point zero one. So it's so it's some area of X four. Wait, is the square root of X squared so is one squared? So really, this function is a function, just a, a, a single real variable x, which I'll call capital F, which is OK. And what are you going to tell me? That's the sum of contacts. And? What do you need? You need a domain to be compact, but A is compact. So. Oh, actually. So you need the domain to be compact. You need the function to be continuous. Is this function continuous? Yeah. Yes. <coughs> so that tells you it has a minimum. There is a point. y in the set A with f of y less than or equal to f of x for all x in A. So there's a point that's closest. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a small detail, but why is big f of x equal to square root of x squared plus 1? I thought it would be x squared minus 1. Well, you're looking at the distance between these two points, right? Right, okay. I was just trying to calculate this, like, P. the square root of... But it's so x square root of x. But, yeah, but it's zero. x minus zero yeah. squared plus zero minus one mm -hmm. quantity squared. Oh, it's x minus... Okay, distance from it, right. Distance from it, right. Mm -hmm. What do you think if you took a compact set in the in Rn? And you try to generalize this slightly. So this is going to be a challenge problem on the next homework. If you take A in Rn to be compact. So compact sets can be a lot weirder than I've been drawing here. They can have lots of holes in them as long as there's no <coughs> limits of things that aren't in the set. So it would have to be a finite number of holes. No. No. Oh. So there's wonderful things called Cantor sets, which are, <laughs> which are very bizarre things. I don't know if some of you have seen them. But no, you can have all sorts of crazy things. So you shouldn't just think that compact sets have to look like balls or spheres or level sets of functions. They can be pretty weird. But here's the question I want to ask. If you have a compact set, are there points A and B in A 
so that if I take any two points in the set, the distance between them is at most the distance between A and B. So what am I doing with my compact set here? You're trying to find the extremes, right? So I'm taking pairs of points and I'm measuring the distance between them. And I'm asking, are there points A and B so that that distance is a maximum? So what's the, what's the, what's the farthest apart I can be with two points in the set? Somebody said the magic word over here. The extremes? Diameter. Diameter. Yeah. It's called the diameter of the set. This is called the diameter. It's the generalization of the diameter of a circle. So in this set, you would presumably take this point here. And what's farthest from it? Probably somewhere uh, on the Either at the top or at the side there. I can't really decide. Yeah, I, I think, think it's at the It might be over here. I'm not sure. No. Uh, <laughs> but basically, like you, you walk around. You take. You, you, you take. You walk around with a friend with a measuring tape. One of you walks around with one end of the measuring tape, the other walks around with the other end of the measuring tape. You just walk everywhere. You walk all over the set, and the question is, what's the longest you ever stretch that measuring tape? That would take forever. That would literally take forever. So those of you interested in, in doing this, it is on the next homework set as a challenge problem. You obviously need to work out some details here. What details would you need to do? What's the domain of what function, for example? Magnitude. Magnitude of what? A minus B is So you want to consider a function okay. of X and Y. And y. Oh. So what's the domain of the function that you feed in X and Y? A, C R a set of R of a set in R4. R2N. Or like R2N. Yeah. Right. So the domain is the set of XY's in R2N. Where x and y are both in A. And show that it's compact. So you'd have to show that as compact. And then you would have to show this function is continuous. continuous. So if you're interested in this, that's points on the next homework assignment. question that's going to show up a lot in both in linear algebra and in calculus applications of the linear algebra is the notion of a norm of a matrix. Let A be an M by an N matrix. And what I'm going to ask you is the following question. Feed in vectors x. Well, what's the most that the matrix A can stretch a vector x? In other words, if you restricted x to have length 1, so imagine you restricted x to be on the unit sphere. So I'm just going to draw it in 2D for the minute. You could take all possible vectors that had length 1, and you could feed them into A and look at Ax. What's the largest magnitude? What's the largest you could get for uh, magnitude? Yes. What is the largest magnitude output you can get? So A doesn't have to be square. Uh, that's right. Is it the square or the square of those entries? 
That's a good guess, but it doesn't have to be. So, do you believe there, why is there a maximum? Because you can't have A is a linear. So, A is linear. So, that's it's continuous. continuous. So, you're starting with Rn. You're taking A and thinking of it as a function to Rm. Now, we're feeding in what <coughs> vectors inside here? Only the ones with magnitude 1. So, we're feeding in the sphere of magnitude 1 vectors. Is that compact? Yes. 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 So, this Level is compact. Set. And then what are we doing once we've done A times X? Taking how much it the stretch. Magnitude. We're taking the magnitude of the output. We're starting with X. We're taking AX. And then we're taking the length of that vector. What have you proved about these functions? Your composition. Compositions. Composition is continuous, but they are both continuous. Sure. Right. You've proved in homework that the magnitude of a vector is a continuous function. And, the and you've proved that linear maps are continuous functions. You've done all the hard work for this class. Uh. So therefore, the if you feed in vectors in this compact set to this continuous function, you'll, you'll get a max. <laughs> right. So there is a max. And we'll pick up tomorrow with exploring for what we think that max might be.